So, hi, um, hi everyone, good morning. Um, welcome to, um, I think it's the first session of the, mass, the FAIR for Machine Learning Interest Group, um, yeah, thing. So um, I'm quite happy to see so many people um, joining this early in the morning. I know it's usually hard. Uh, I know it's for me. So um, I'll get right to it. So the session today basically has two main parts. The first is sort of to do a quick overview of what is the interest group, what has been doing so far, set a bit of the stakes, and then start discussing a bit together how we should better organize the work of the interest group moving forward. And the second part will be much more specific, and it's be around one of the activities that we already identify as a more relevant one, which is about defining um, outlining what would be a possible white paper out of this um, interest group around fair for machine learning as the name implies. So I'll start by saying that um, you can find the shared notes in these links. Um, the slides are already linked there, so you'll be able to see everything if you want. Um, of course, this is an RDA session, which means that it falls under the RDA code of conduct. Uh, if you haven't done this already, I would urge you to have a look at the code of conduct. Basically, uh, be nice, don't make other people vulnerable, and sort of make a very positive environment to collaborate. Um, the collaborative notes we'll be using um, from here onward basically to keep track of the discussion. There's already a table in it, um, so I would also like to ask you to sign in. It would be useful to keep track of who is actually part of this session and part of the discussion. And I'll be sharing um, the link on the um, on the WAVA app, I think. At least I'll try to do so. Um, I'm not a familiar with the app, to be honest. Right. Um, so, welcome. Um, this is the agenda. So, um, after doing a quick overview of what the um, of what we've been doing up until this point to make this industry happen, uh, we'll have three um, short presentations to set the stage. Um, one's about um, uh, recommendations, the recommendations of reporting for machine learning. The other one's going to be about um, the metadata for machine learning. And the last one is going to be about registries for machine learning. Um, with those sort of perspectives in, in mind, we'll then dive into a discussion about um, what would be the um, ideal goals of the interest group, short-term activities, and also a bit of the organizational aspects. Uh, which also implies people who might be interested in sort of collating this and co-chain this. Um, after that, as I said, uh, we'll focus on the white paper itself. So that's the quick outline of the agenda. We'll try to keep this um, uh, to the time as much as I can. So I'll, I'll try to keep track of that. And with that, I think I will give the floor to Dan for the outline. All right, thank you. Um, there, I guess I was actually trying to see, is there an RDA volunteer here who has the sign-in sheet that's going to be passed around? No, okay. Um, so in theory, there should be a sign-in sheet that gets passed around, I don't, yes? We use our collaborative tools. <laughs> we, we can, if you're, yeah, if you're online, you can certainly do that. I just, uh, in all the other sessions, there's a piece of paper that goes around for people that aren't online. So I'm not sure what happened here. Maybe this room isn't part of the session. <laughs> Um, okay, but let's let's go ahead in any case. Uh, so what is fair? Um, actually, I guess I should say I learned I have five minutes, so I'm, maybe I'll skip what is fair because maybe everybody knows what is fair. Actually, is there anybody that doesn't know what fair is? Should we go through this? I'm happy to. Okay, I don't see anybody volunteering, so I'm going to skip fair. I'll just say that fair is important. Uh, so, so have you... Actually, I, I could say that fair is a clever name as well. Um, but okay, so having said that, then so we have the idea that we do have these fair principles that lots of people think are important, and even more people think are clever, and uh, and that they need to do something even if they don't completely understand them. Um, but but one of the challenges is that the fair principles were written very very strongly in the context of data. Um, Right. The, the, the people that were writing and were thinking about data, they tried to be more general than data, but they really were thinking about data. And so um, while the principles are intended to apply to all digital objects, they don't quite do that directly at a, at a low level. They do that at a high level. Um, and so 
there are other groups that have looked at what happens for other kinds of objects and, and what needs to be done to FAIR. And in particular, uh, the, uh, the FAIR practice task force in ES a couple of years ago had a set of recommendations. And one of those recommendations was to recognize that the FAIR guidelines <coughs> require a translation for other kinds of digital objects. And it was important to, to support such activities. And so that's effectively what we're kind of talking about here is one of those things. How do we take these FAIR principles that were created for data and apply them to machine learning. What does that exactly mean? Um, so this work has happened in, in a bunch of other contexts. We had uh, initially work on making training materials fair, uh, work on making computational workflows fair, work on making uh, research software fair, um, and work on making virtual research environments fair. And in all these cases, again, the ideas of findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, um, clearly apply, but exactly how they apply is different. And, and that's the case for machine learning as well. So uh, one in, in RDA, we had the FAIR principles for a research software group. There's uh, three of us at least were involved in this. Uh, maybe, uh, actually maybe more of us were involved in this. Mm -hmm. um, this was a, a joint RDA Force 11 uh, Research Software Alliance or RISA working group. <coughs> Over 18 months, we had a lot of community discussions and we worked on how would you apply these FAIR principles to research software? And then how could those principles, once we figured them out, actually be adopted? Uh, and um, about uh, nine months ago, uh, we created a, a set of principles um, that's down on the bottom. Uh, and then since then, we've been working on adoption and the work on adoption actually has become part of the uh, software source code interest group, which is going to be meeting immediately after this in the in the lobby area of this of this room. So if you're interested in that, go go outside after the break and, and stay in that next bit just outside here. Um, so as I've said, FAIR applies to uh, scholarly digital research objects, at least in theory, but it really focuses on metadata and data specifically. And uh, in the FAIR for Research software work and the FAIR workflow work, we've worked on um, how to translate and interpret those principles for research software and for workflows. And so then when we think about machine learning and machine learning models in particular, the question that comes up is, can we think of machine learning models as data? Um, you could think of them potentially as a set of parameters and options that go with a particular framework and, and that's just data. And so maybe machine learning models are covered under the original FAIR principles and we don't need to do anything. Uh, or you could think of machine learning models as software. It's an executable object that takes input and, and creates output, right? Which is not data. Oh, sorry, the input and output are data, but the, the thing in the middle is not. Um, and so maybe machine learning models fit under the FAIR principles for research software. Uh, or maybe they're a combination of data and software and maybe workflows, because you could think of machine learning models in some way as a workflow as well. Um, or maybe there's something else. And that's really what this interest group is trying to figure out is where, where do machine learning models fit in mm -hmm. and how do we apply FAIR to them? Do we apply FAIR to the model? Do we apply FAIR to the input data set and the model together? And does that mean something different than just the model? So when you look at the FAIR principles and if you've done work in trying to make data FAIR, uh, you realize that a lot of the, uh, the FAIR principles for data are dependent on archival repositories. Right. You, somebody creates data, you put the data into a repository along with metadata, that repository actually shares it, it makes it findable, it makes it accessible, uh, so forth. Um, software is different because software isn't typically shared via archival repositories, but it's shared via social coding platforms like, like GitHub or package management systems. Um, I will just say, and this came up yesterday or the day before as well, uh, GitHub uses the word repository, but it's not the same as FAIR repositories, right? It's not an archival repository. It's a completely different meaning of the same word, which is a little bit confusing. Um, machine learning models, again, we don't really have a good, I don't think, idea of what community practice is going to be about how they're actually uh, searched and shared. Um, it could be that they're searched and shared through repositories like Zenodo, for example, or, or, or other archival repositories. I think that's done to some extent. Um, they could be searched and shared via executable platforms. And, and then there's also other things. There's something called uh, DL Hub, a deep learning library, uh, deep learning hub. Uh, OpenML is a platform that does this. So, so we have kind of this mix right now where we haven't settled on the idea of, of a way to do this. And that leads to questions about, again, what actually FAIR means and who needs to apply FAIR. Because right? the creators of data sets can't apply FAIR by themselves without the repositories. 
right? Creating a fair machine learning model, probably you can't apply fair by yourself without some infrastructure. And we don't completely know what the right infrastructure is yet. Uh, and then the last thing, as I mentioned before, is that models and training data are really very strongly linked, right? A model doesn't make any sense without the concept of the training data that was used to build it. And so should they be shared together? Should they be shared separately? We don't really know yet. So this is again, one of the, one of the other questions for the interest group. Um, so <coughs> where we are at this point, we started actually four plenaries ago with a, a poster. Um, this was the first virtual plenary and it was a poster, which wasn't a good idea at that time because I don't think anybody knew how to do a poster in a virtual plenary. Um, so I think I, I was the virtual poster host and I talked to two people during the poster session. Um, so you can, you can find the poster if you want, it's still there, it's still useful. Uh, we did uh, both at uh, the next plenary, which was a much better idea. We actually had some nice discussion. Um, we've done a couple of other activities. Uh, at the Fair Festival, we did a talk. We've had a community call. We did a talk at a, a, another workshop called Domulos. Uh, a BOF at VP18. Uh, a BOF at the Supercomputing Conference a year and a half ago. And out of all these, we gathered a group of people that were interested in this and gathered some inputs and use that basically to write the interest group statement and to get that through the RDA process. And, and here we are now at the beginning of this process with, with an interest group that has been approved by RDA um, and, uh, and trying to, to figure out what, what we're going to do. And so uh, as, as Fotis was saying, um, really what we're trying to do today, starting this interest group, is to do better organization than we've done up to this point. We have three of us that have signed up to be co-chairs. Uh, we would be very interested in more people. The, the Fair for Research software group, we had nine co-chairs and that actually worked really well. Um, it, was, it was great to have different people who could take responsibility for different pieces. Uh, we wanted to find the idea of what the interest group will do, potentially think about task forces that can go off and do things and come back to the full interest group and, and report on them. Um, and ultimately, again, to, to build a community of practice for, uh, for sharing information and, and figuring out what Fair means in the context of machine learning. And then second, we're going to look at a white paper, which is something that came out of all those meetings that I was talking about on the last slide. There was a lot of interest in, in trying to just write a kind of a state of the art white paper to talk about what challenges there are and what the issues are. Um, and so we have some ideas of questions there, which could turn into sections potentially of a white paper. And, and that's the other question is kind of how do we organize this paper? Who, who actually is interested in contributing? Who's interested potentially in leading a section? So that's, that's where we're going to go. Um, in order to, uh, oh, sorry. Um, and, and the reason that we're doing that is to get to the, uh, the, the outcomes of the interest group in some sense, right? An interest group is not a working group. It doesn't have fixed outcomes in a fixed time, but it does have the idea that we're gonna do something. We're not just sitting around talking. Um, and so we want to, over the, over the life of the interest group, think about right, what are the use cases that actually work for FAIR for machine learning? Uh, how do we define fair for machine learning? Do we need new principles? Do we just apply existing principles? Um, can we think about recommendations and guidance to help uh, developers of models and others? Uh, can we think about technical specifications that are needed? Uh, can we think about how we would actually train people to do these different things? Um, yeah, so, so a bunch of different things around trying to improve the, the state of the art of machine learning and how it is made fair. Okay, so that's that's this part, and then we will move on to uh, to three kind of lightning-ish talks uh, to to start off and give some context of where things are. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> although it's us mostly talking for the time being, um, if there are any questions or any comments up to this point, I think it may be useful to sort of do a quick. Yeah, we take. do have lots of time for questions and. Great. The people online. We have lots of time for questions and discussion at the end, but if there are any questions just on anything that I presented initially, we could try to do that really quickly. Or it's Friday morning. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. So, um, as I said, there are basically um, three kind of quick talks. One is about reporting, the other one is about metadata, and the last one is about registries. So, for the <clears throat> sorry for the reporting. I want to do a quick um, outline of one of the major outcomes of the Elixir machine learning focus group. <clears throat> so Elixir is basically, for those who are not aware of it, um, is the pan-European infrastructure for life science, for mathematics. Um, the main remits of the infrastructures are life science data. 
and how to better connect um, the data infrastructure across the various countries. Mm -hmm. It's one of the more um, mature infrastructures, <coughs> at least in life sciences, and it's been quite active um, for a bit over a decade now, if I, if I do the math correctly. Um, what it does, it tries to connect the technical people with the um, life science experts and make sure that whatever is an outcome is really useful and practical um, for, for the um, researchers. Um, in the context of all these efforts, a few years ago, um, of course, there was a, um, in, an initiative around machine learning for life sciences, uh, which um, in the context of Elixir is a focus group. Um, the main idea of, of this focus group when it was created was to basically look into five major um, directions. The one is about defining standards. And I'll talk to them about them in, in like a second. Uh, the second one is about benchmarking, which is more of a technical effort, how to ensure that the tools, the efforts, the approaches that are around this learning can be evaluated. Um, making sure that um, machine learning processes are fair and reproducible, which is a clear link to this industry group as well. Um, integrate across Elixir communities. This is uh, more of an inward Elixir effort. And of course, talking about training. Um, it is not usually a good approach to have the infrastructure and the service and the tools in place without people actually knowing how to, to use them effectively. Um, one of the um, first things that we started looking into is about how um, prominent machine learning has become in life science. And as you can see, um, there is a lot of publications around machine learning over the last few years. And this is an exponential growth. Um, the problem is that if you look at them, and there was analysis done um, a few years ago, 20% um, of all publications that include machine learning in life science actually did not apply any kind of evaluation, which means that you have essentially what amounts to I did something and I have new biological insights, but I have no information about the something, no assessment, no evaluation, nothing whatsoever, which is um, <laughs> worrying um, to say the least. So um, for this reason, one of the first activities that we, 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 we did was to try to figure out what can we do to effectively provide some guidance um, on how to actually report machine learning. Because as, you, as I say, so here, the main problem is that they probably did kind of evaluation, we hope, but they never reported in the text itself, in the manuscript. So what we end up was um, with these DOM recommendations. DOM is a very nice acronym. I, I wish I could, I could take credit for that, but unfortunately I'm not that imaginative. And it stands for data optimization model evaluation. Um, the interesting thing is that this was not the effort of a single person but rather a um, comprehensive effort across all 23 nodes of, of the Elixir networks. And basically over 50 people were actively involved, which means that this is as an approach, um, hopefully it's ultimately standard in under first sharing. Um, it is something that can be endorsed by a wider um, kind of audience. Um, the actual um, recommendations are, have been published uh, about a year ago, two years ago now. Um, and I would definitely urge you to have a quick look about it. Uh, but essentially what it does, it provides some very critical questions that one should be expected to report on across these four main pillars. Uh, for data, again, it's the starting point. It was quite useful to know where the data came from, um, <laughs> what are the splits you used in the machine learning process, if there was any redundancy, and of course, ultimately, can I actually have access to data? Is it available somewhere or is it something that you have um, stored somewhere away in, in your own infrastructure? And the second one is about the actual um, algorithm, the process itself. Um, what is the algorithm? Is it a new one? And if it's a new one, why are you not publishing it, for example, in a more relevant um, uh, venue that is um, better equipped to assess the algorithm value of that and not directly, for example, life sciences one? Um, if you do any kind of data encoding, what are the parameters? Essentially, overall, the context of the algorithm itself so that people can know exactly how to rerun things if, if at all possible. Um, the model itself is the outcome, if you like, of the process. Um, again, <laughs> some very lightweight questions, if you look at them, common sense, rather. Um, how much did it cost to run? Uh, in terms of time, resources, um, can I rerun this if I know that I require the entire Google 
compute infrastructure to run it. And I force I don't have access to that. <clears throat> and of course, the same point is, do you have access to the code itself? Um, as a quick uh, reminder, the previous one is about the software, the algorithm itself, uh, which is sort of the theoretical approach. This is exactly the code that was used, that was implemented or used to run the process. And finally, uh, of course, the evaluation, uh, which start the whole thing. You've done the whole process, you did the machine learning model, you, you, you create new insights. How do you actually evaluate if this actually worked? Uh, did you test across a different? Um, yes, Isabel, please. What about the, the accuracy of the model? This can is you, basically. Can you repeat the question? Well, what about sorry. the accuracy of the model? What about the accuracy of the model? Okay. I have a microphone here, so <laughs> I should be moving this around in a second. Um, so this is exactly where it comes. So the evaluation has all these components in place. Talk about how did you report, which metrics did you use, accuracy being one of them, for example, but also how did you actually compare this? Did you use an additional data set that was completely outside of the ones that you use for the training itself? Same context, but different data set. Um, and one of my favorite ones, instead of just saying that my accuracy is like 99.9%, uh, do you have a confident interval? like some lightweight statistics around it. Yes. And I, I rather mean uh, ex explainability of the model, uh, like this uh, life science, we are using uh, uh, XML instead of uh, just ML. And so we use uh, the combination uh, of formal methods to ensure uh, we are reaching an accuracy uh especially for the life science so this is the interpretability part as you can see the first yeah. point is about here so all those common sense questions are being part of that and again that's why i'm going to urge you to have a look at the at the more detailed table of these questions in there this is more of the outline but you're actually right it's not so uh, the last point that i want to make and then i'll i'll, I'll cut this short to actually have time for discussion is that um the main idea of of these recommendations and again we are considering them as a standard within elixir for the time being at least hopefully beyond um it's to make sure that things are important effectively it does not provide an assessment of the quality if you like or the usefulness of the process this is up to the reviewer or the general community to assess. The important part is that following the DOM recommendations, you essentially um, expect to have sufficient information to do this kind of an assessment. So it is a facilitator of the quality assessment, if you like, because you need to have all this information around the process, from the data to the model, to the algorithm, to the implementation, to the actual evaluation, to make any kind of a coherent um, assessment of whether it's actually useful, if it makes sense, if I can reuse it, and everything else. I think that's kind of it. Um, and that was my last slide. Of course, I need to acknowledge um, the entire um, machine learning Fox group. Um, and so, sorry. And you can find also more information about um, the website that we put here. And we're going to be kicking this much um, more intensive in the next two years. Yes, please. Sorry, I'm stepping in. <clears throat> I'm not a computer scientist, but I uh, would like to know whether this dome applies for any um, discipline, or is it discipline agnostic, or is it uh, only for life sciences? Maybe it seems to me question. it can uh, it can apply. Right. So, thanks for that. Um, the short answer. And I have a longer just after uh, it's is indeed is, is um, domain agnostic. So the questions themselves are quite open. And um, when we initially worked on that, because we are coming from Elixir, which is life sciences, um, there was an expectation that it should be my, more life science oriented. When we actually submitted it for review, um, the um, there was a strong recommendation to even narrow this down a bit more in <laughs> of scope. And so the ultimate article is about machine learning in biology, not even like in life sciences in general. That being said, um, and as I said, we are gearing to be more intensive around the recommendations in, this, in the next year and a half more. And the idea is to review the application of the DOM recommendation in other domains, in other disciplines, in other context, even within life sciences. For example, one of the key questions that have come up is that 
when you apply this reporting into, for example, a <laughs> clinical context, you might need to have additional questions posted in because you have much more um, uh, important requirements that you need to take in consideration when reporting. It's much more um, um, strict. If you want to apply this into um, another type of life science domain, you might want to have a different perspective or relax some of the questions. All of those we will be reviewing in the next couple of um, years. Um, but hopefully, again, the ambition is for this to be um, adopted by pretty much any kind of domain because the questions are domain agnostic. <coughs> so thanks for the question. Um, anything else? Yes, please. There's it's one. Fun. Yeah, um, so Chris Erdman, uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation. I, I, uh, um, I'm part of a group called the Open Modeling Foundation, and I'm wondering if there's a c connection between what you're doing and and because we're after the same thing. <laughs> so it would be great to have like you know our, our groups sort of working together because we're working on standards and we're working on you know and we have we have a group from all over the world working on this together. Um, it's a Sloan funded project. And I think a lot of the things that you're after align with what we're doing in our working groups right now. Um, so I'm just, I'm wondering if someone from the dome group is involved. I haven't checked, but maybe, maybe there is a, is a connection between our groups. Hopefully. I am not aware of such a connection, to be honest. Um, I'm actually leading this um, more of the outreach part of the dome recommendation in, in the, this current effort. So I'd be more than happy to have a chat on how this could be better connected. So awesome. And there was another question. Thank you. Um, Daniel Garijo from Politecnica de Madrid. Um, uh, I've been seeing that uh, at least within the machine learning community, they use uh, something called model cards, right? So I was wondering, and and it's very uh, some of the things that they track for it's very similar. So I was wondering whether uh, you have uh, uh, tied this work to to that existing work, and also one thing that they do, which I think is uh, crucial for for these kind of things, is. Um, uh, considering when the model should or should not be used. For instance, if I try to train this for trucks, do not use it for cars, right? Um, so they have like an ethical and consideration also uh, slot to, to make sure that this, the model is not misused or, or at least that you don't find surprises later. So, and this is by the way, um, what I've seen people do in Hagen phase, which is uh, one of the most common uh, platform for sharing models. So I was wondering if, if this is somehow related and how it does, does it relate? Thank you. All right, many thanks for all these questions. So I'll, I'll start from the last one, which is easier. Um, we are in contact with Hugging Face and we have exchanged a few ideas of how this could be better connected in the context of the double recommendation of the Fair for Machine Learning, uh, Fair for Machine Learning Interest Group. Um, so hopefully this will move forward as well. Um, about the implementation, which is basically your first two questions, um, we are really trying to avoid looking into the quality assessment part or the validation part um, for the main reason that it's, it requires an additional level of um, community review to make sure that anything that we propose as an approach is valid enough and supported by a wide community. <laughs> So for example, talking about ethics and whether this is applicable or not, should be in this context up to the reviewer who will be taking the output of the DOM recommendations of the reporting, look at the work and say, look, you've reported that you used your training on cars and you want to apply this in, I don't know, uh, potatoes, right? This, the, the reporting is fine. You did report this correctly. So in terms of DOM recommendation <laughs> adherence, you've done that. But if you look at the work itself, this is not correct. So the purpose of the DOM recommendation is to provide efficient reporting of all the information necessary for anyone which is an expert in the field to make a correct assessment of whether the work is correct, incorrect, requires improvement, et cetera. So it's part of the review process, if you like. And for this reason, one of the main, the, the, one of the target stakeholders, if you like, of the DOM recommendations, and this is one of the activities that we are actually pushing forward uh, is to connect with the various um, journals 
to adopt this as part of the review process. We have already two that are quite open to the idea. It's the question that we're trying to figure out is how to actually implement that with minimal impact for both the authors and the reviewers without restructuring the whole submission system. But this is going to be one of the major impacts I will see as the double commendation. Make sense? Awesome. Right, so I think, uh, right. So last question then we move on because I think we are um, having too much. So I just, maybe I missed, uh, do you also consider a reproducibility of machine learning models and projects? I think the reproducibility part <laughs> is here in the sense of do you actually have all the information required to reproduce that? We are not specifically asking for have you reproduced it or um, we are asking someone else to reproduce it but all the information required to actually reproduce the whole effort from the algorithm itself to the um, uh, the actual software used for that are part of the questions of the recommendation so it is around reproducibility but it's not specifically for reproducibility. but still using this concept of reproducibility quite important because acm require reproducibility for papers so Avoiding this, you're actually missing a lot of. And second, you also uh, told about assessing. Assessing is another uh, angle or dimension of FAIR. And this is much more serious because assessing means auditing, means evaluation, and so on. So this means need to be much stricter defined. Absolutely agree. That's why I've, I've said already that the recommendations are not about fair. <coughs> They're facilitators of fair, if you like. So they put all the information together so that you can move forward about fair for machine learning, for example, which includes the reproducibility part. So it by itself, again, it's about reporting all the required information. Whether someone else said to reproduce or not is currently at least beyond the DOM recommendations themselves. Think of it as literally you need to report this information. Where this information ultimately allows for reproducibility remains to be seen. For example, I may write an article and nothing is reproduced. In all these questions, I'll put blanks. I can still submit it, but then the reviewers will see, look, looking at this checklist of the DOM recommendations, all this is missing. So I cannot consider this as reproducible, so I'm going to reject it. So the question here is about what needs to be reported. Whether that is actually of good quality or bad quality, whether it's correct or not, is not part of the DOM recommendations to actually provide information about. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Is fair an instrument or target? This, I think, is a more have a discussion to have actually in the second part of the session today because it's part of the interest group. So I'll, I'll put a pause here and we get this discussion in a second again. So I think I'll leave it for now to <laughs> Leila. Hello, everybody. My name is Leila El Castro. I, thank you. <laughs> I'm part of uh, CERVEMET Information Center for Life Sciences, and I'm going to present today the NFDI for Data Science, um, that it's an initiative in Germany. It's going to try this one. Oh, no. So it's the next one. Okay, so NFDI in Germany, it's a um, set of consortia that. Um, NFDI means National Research Data Infrastructure. Despite of the data in the name of the acronym, it's actually beyond data. It is considering <laughs> software as well, workflows, training materials, et cetera, et cetera. So it's data in the very broad sense of what data means. And there are different institutions all across Germany participating in this uh, NFDI for data science, which is one of the about 20 NFDI consortia that exist in Germany nowadays. Uh, this one is uh, cross-disciplinary, as you can imagine. Some of the others are kind of targeting a particular domain or discipline, for instance, biodiversity, health, uh, there is one about text particularly, but this one is cross-disciplinary because the artificial intelligence and data science, they are cross-disciplinary. So this is kind of um, a quick difference with, with the DOM principles. We need to be interdisciplinary. We, we just have to, uh, but we will see the, the connection with the DOM principles uh, in a moment. You, you can see all, all the institutions in there, I'm not going to through all of them. 
Um, this is the vision on FDI for data science, but I'm going to summarize this in making things easier for researchers. Um, if you saw the um, talk by Hans on Monday, he talked about why researchers prefer to go to um, commercial clouds or some other um, elements that are kind of, let's say, outside uh, research, but most industry. And it's basically because <clears throat> they're easy to use. They don't ask too many things. This is good because easy to use is, yes, something that we all could. Uh, but in research, we need to ask a little bit more of questions because we really want to know what you are using, using the data for. How is the data split, as it was mentioned in the DOM recommendations? We need that information for fairness, for reproducibility, for better science. <laughs> and um, yes, that might be a little bit more of uh, effort, but we really hope that the researchers will see the benefits and will see kind of the um, responsibility that they have towards society in providing this information. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the summary, making things easier and making them integrated so they can be compliant with uh, FAIR, with the DOM principles and uh, moving towards reproducibility. Here we have like a quick overview of the different um, institutions participating again with all the bits that they are bringing together. But maybe a more interesting view is how this is aligned with uh, the data cycle. And it is a data cycle because, well, we need data for data to be trained and we might produce new data, we will be collecting data and the models will act on data. So we are using the data research cycle kind of um, as a driven for um, our, um, as a driver, sorry, for our, uh, our services in NFDI for data science. <laughs> so we have here the different bits in the data research cycle that we are uh, taking into account. And here we can see how the different services that we already have align to these different elements on the research data cycle. There are kind of, um, well, there is a bunch of colors in here, but I'm going to refer to two particular colors, the black font and the white font. The black font are services that already exist. Uh, they are being improved in order to align better uh, to the NFPI for data science, but the, why, the ones with wide font, they don't exist yet. And those are the ones that are mainly targeting metadata, fairness, and reproducibility. And why they don't exist? Well, we don't have enough metadata. As Otis mentioned, sometimes we don't even have enough text-based data in the publications. So, well, we cannot create something out of nothing. So we need that information and that's why we are targeting those and uh, they will become kind of a main component in the NFDI for data science uh, port. So let's go into move uh, to the synergy with Elixir and RDA. And um, here we will be kind of taking again some of the questions that you ask. Uh, we are going to start working with the DOM principles, uh, with the recommendations. Those recommendations are to publish, to give information in the text, in your publication. We want to transform that into metadata. So it is also matching processable, not only human processable, and uh, processable in a very quick way. Um, while in the DOM principles, we are thinking about kind of maybe tables to fill in. We want to transform that uh, into metadata. And we want to go further uh, because, uh, and this is something that we are doing, of course, in collaboration with, uh, with the Elixir Machine Learning Focus Group. The DOM recommendations, they were um, thought for supervised machine learning in particular, but if you see, some of them will apply for other sort of learning um, as well. So we want to increase the coverage of the DOM recommendations and transform that into metadata. And um, something that it is very important here is that Based on metadata, and this would be a first layer, it will not be a full reproducible layer, but just a first layer based on metadata, we want to create in silico protocols for reproducibility. If uh, any of you come from wet lab, maybe you have heard about lab protocols. Lab protocols is something that they work in wet labs, and they have tons of information and they need all that information for the next person in the lab to be able to do exactly the same thing. <clears throat> 
So if it has to be shaking this way, that will be in the lab protocol, how to shake the, the thing, the solution that, that they work with. It's that detailed. So we cannot get to that detail um, to start with because then everybody would going to jump like, no, I have too much work already. No, so don't worry, we will start with a first layer of metadata and we want to work on this in silico protocols. Um, we have started to work on this transition from DOM to metadata already uh, in the Elixir Biohackathon, and that was in collaboration with the task force about synthetic data. As what is mentioned, if you are working with health data, you will want to provide some additional information uh, that will make it easier for someone else willing to use that uh, data set for training to say like, okay, yes, this is compatible with what I want to do, at least at a first stage. Most likely, yes, you have to go inside the data and have a second look. But if with the metadata, the first look, you can say like, okay, yes, I want to go further. It's like having the abstract and based on the abstract, you decide whether or not you want the full text. You don't start with the full text. So we want to start with the metadata and uh, make things easier at that level for researchers. So uh, this is the connection uh, with Elixir and with RDA. Well, we really hope that uh, we connect with the RDA community and through the RDA community with other communities, as it has been uh, mentioned already. Chris, please count me in for these uh, discussions. Um, that you are doing <laughs> about machine learning, that would be great to have that connection as well. And uh, it will be a big change because we will require for researchers to be willing to provide the metadata as they do for publications. It is nowadays natural for publications, um, but it's not the normal <coughs> thing, it's not the common thing for data, for software, for workflows, for machine learning, etc. So we have to get there. We know it will be slow. We know it will not happen tomorrow, but we have to start. And I think that was it that I wanted to share with you today. Thank you very much. Questions? Um, that the work that you're trying to do to sort of make this actionable, right, for, um, you know, how to sort of make these models more available and other things like that, that um, that's very much, there is another group, <laughs> forgot to mention this one, but EarthCube um, has a group that is working on um, this as well. And one of the things that came upon when we were all discussing it was that we would create sort of like this checklist that you could insert in one of these data availability statements, you know, it can just say, I, I looked at this checklist because I've been on the other side, on the, the journal side <laughs> and getting a full checklist like this in is gonna, you're going to lose a lot of teeth that it's going to take time. And uh, so like the, the more practical approach was like, Hey, I can, you know, insert this into my availability statement. And mm -hmm. it could be like a signal that I've, you know, gone through these steps for making my, my model and other things fair, just to start, right? Like as a way to, cause that's what journals use. Well, a good number of them now, but availability statements. And, uh, um, and I, I didn't get a chance to say this, but it's, uh, we're also working with, uh, with, uh, hugging face. It's a great name. Um, but they're in, they're based in Brooklyn and they're uh, also in Paris. And there's actually a machine learning librarian, really cool, uh, at, at uh, Hugging Face. And they're doing really amazing things. And, and we actually have an upcoming webinar with them with Fairpoints in June. And uh, they're, they're actually looking to create connections with the community and talked about, we talked about doing health data hackathons and you know like because their 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 platform is highly collaborative so it'd be really great to partner with people on that too but so Chris, just, just to let you know um, we we've had hugging face people involved in this group also and if this meeting wasn't at uh 2 a.m brooklyn time uh, we, would have, we would have actually we would have had a talk from them so they were interested in talking it just the time didn't work okay yeah yeah, and we are also looking into the metadata that they don't expose as metadata as a structured metadata, but they have some elements, those 
all boards that you can use for indexing and for searching in there. So we are looking into it together with other machine learning platforms to extrapolate the metadata model that it is already used by them. I, uh, I, uh, I really enjoy your talk. And now uh, going a, a little bit into the details and, and coming back to the reproducibility, uh, how do you address uh, the challenge of uh, reproduce the, you know, the transfer function of a neural network? Because this is, for me, this is a challenge. Uh, this is the most difficult part. So I would like to have a, a little help on that. We all, I would say, <laughs> would like to have a little help on that. We, we are just starting this up, so I cannot really um, answer your question because the in situ <coughs> protocol doesn't exist yet. It's something that we are working as part of a PhD thesis, so it will take a couple of years to come. Um, however, I, I'm not sure if transfer learning is part of reproducibility, maybe it goes beyond, uh, but it is an important aspect. I don't think we are considering that one to start with. We are going to being able to do what the author says that can be done with the data that they, that they uh, produce. But yes, indeed, transfer learning is an important thing. And we are seeing this in, in health uh, science because sometimes simply you have more data for one organism than for the other or for one organ than the other. So you have to use and extrapolate from what you have. But we are not uh, targeting that particularly now. That's why I introduced the uh, explain explainability of the function because uh, if you, if you formalize the transfer function, and then you can uh, you can uh, reproduce something. If not, it's absolutely impossible. Okay. So the challenge for life science is uh, is always to reproduce uh, uh, an experience. So towards the different uh, intent and yes. use. Yes. So. Yeah, I, I cannot say that we will tackle this or not because we are just starting. So it's still too yeah, early to the, say. As far as uh, the literature is showing that uh, the NIH is, uh, is uh, really invest is, is investing some money on that uh, uh, XML, so. Thank you. All right, so thanks again. Um, and I think we can move to our next um, presenter, which is online. And um, that would be Gemma. So um, Gemma, will you be sharing your screen? Yes. Um, yeah, can I, maybe I can try. Um, okay. So there we go. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so that should work, right? Yep. Perfect. Yeah, if there are any uh, questions, I only have one screen, so I'm not seeing the chat or anything, so you can just interrupt me or I'll take the questions at the end. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Gemma. Uh, disclaimer, I'm a molecular biologist by training, so I'm really not a computer scientist. Um, I am the co-founder and CEO of Ercilia, which is a small nonprofit organization working to provide machine learning tools um, specifically for drug discovery in low resource settings, focusing on infectious and neglected diseases. But today I'm here to talk a bit more about the role of registries in machine learning and how can this help for the um, actually end use of all these models by people that may not actually be computer scientists or software developers. So I'm gonna hopefully bring into a bit of the perspective of the end users of these models. So um, what is a machine learning registry? Well, it's a repository of um, machine learning models, trained machine learning models that hopefully they have like a unique identifier, they have all the model artifacts, which means that you can run them so they are ready for deployment. 
They also have all the associated metadata that we have discussing, the parameters, the different, uh, maybe during the steps that have taken, the versioning history, the data availability, if it's there, interpretation, etc. And something that has already come up here is that GitHub is not a machine learning reg um, registry, but most of the current machine learning models that are being developed, especially in academia, um, on my uh, on life sciences, which is the field I know most about, is done there in GitHub, um, which is a good start, but is not the best solution for actually sharing all these models. Um, so just to add some numbers to these, if you do quick searches, there are a lot of studies but just some that I found last week um, doing a bit of research. So 70% uh, of the bioinformatic resources that are being developed in life sciences are not really cited again in the book, like their publications are not cited. 28% of the URLs um, that are reported in, in publications are no longer accessible. And on a small test that they did on a subset of the, I think about a hundred of these tools, 49% were qualified as not easy to install by computer scientists. So imagine for a non-expert, this would be even more difficult to actually use. And um, so seeing these numbers, you um, start to think, um, okay, so what can we do to make this um, more usable? Because at the end, we develop all these machine learning models, not to be sitting in a repository, but to actually be used. Um, so I just wanted to give an example that this happens across all levels um, by all people. So, this is a repository that is really relevant to the work we do at Ercilia, which provides QSAR models for several administration and absorption, absorption administration, metabolism and excretion endpoints. So um, cytosolic stability, metabolism by cytochrome, solubility, et cetera. This is great. It's uh, trained on uh, private data from the NCATS initiative. Uh, so it's a lot of data that is going on there. Um, so it would be great that we are able to actually reuse that. Um, but actually, when you go into their GitHub repository, so the installation is pretty much manual, um, where you need to install other packages like Emprop on top of it. It has several branches. So actually, like you need to check whether you're working on the main, on the development branch. There is not a unique identifier for each model. So it's just a link where you can download them. And very easily, you may confuse um, which model are you using. It's difficult to actually find the original publications where each one of these models and the associated data was reported, right? So all these are issues that you find across many repositories, um, across many publications. Um, so of course, um, uh, let me just bring this into context of the work that we are doing at Ercilia. Ercilia is a nonprofit organization that provides ready-to-use machine learning models for infectious disease research to scientists in low resource settings. By low resource settings, we mean mostly across the global south, but in general, scientists that may not be part of a larger institute, that they don't have access to actual computer scientists, that they cannot go to anyone for help. I've been in this situation as a lab scientist. It's quite frustrating when you see all these very cool papers being published, but you are actually not able to use the things that they are reporting because you don't even know where to start with. Um, at Ercilia, um, we do not only provide machine learning models, um, our work is englobed. Um, in our work in globes much more. The first one is that we always work on the open source. So we work with models that are open source or everything that we develop is also released in open, under open source licenses. We also work doing capacity building and supporting those experimental scientists on actually using these tools. And we focus on in-country research, meaning that we travel to our partner organizations across the global south and we sit with them. We try to make sure they can implement our tools. And we focus on making models that emphasize the use of local resources like natural products. Um, okay, so bringing the discussion back to um, when we focus on providing these machine learning models to our end users, to the scientists um, working in their local institutions in different countries. Um, our goals are that the models have deployment options for non-experts. They have version control, meaning that um, you always know what changes have been made to these models. They enhance collaboration, meaning that are all the models open? Um, is the code open? Can people actually like then see the data? Can they um, maybe start a collaboration with a group that is developing a model and so on? Um, is the data open? We work in the domain of drug discovery, so that is not always the case. And in that, um, in when that happens, we need to think of other um, ways to bypass uh, the lack of open data, such as 
privacy preserving machine learning methods, but also adding more information as much as we can without revealing the underlying uh, information about the compounds of the composition of the data set of how to interpret the results or what of what is the applicability domain of these models, etc. And our end goal is that these models are easy to interpret, they are explainable, and um, everyone knows uh, what has gone into the model uh, to train it. Um, so where can machine learning models, uh, regist machine learning model registries contribute to, to this? So of course, at least they should provide unique and persistent identifiers. They should have a way of controlling which version of the model, whether the packages are updated, et cetera. All the metadata should be indexed and searchable. Um, the models ideally should be executable either online or through easy um, command line, uh, for example, or a graphical user interface. And ideally they should also provide options for easily integrating into other software. Um, so this is a bit the platform that we are building, which is again, very focused on drug discovery for antimicrobial for infectious diseases and where you can search several models. At this moment, we are only incorporating models that have been published already in the literature and validated. We also gonna start incorporating models that we are developing ourselves with data from our collaborators. Um, and now we have around hundred models and this is constantly growing um, thanks to a pipeline of open source contributors. Um, but just to finish on time, because I know we are maybe a bit delayed, there are many other initiatives, like I think some have been mentioned, Deep Learning Hub, OpenML, Model Hub, Kipoi. I think also now um, having phase is gonna start a section focused on biomedical research, with it, which is fantastic. Um, but basically, uh, I just wanted to share a bit more about the importance of making this usable and making this reproducible so that end users don't have to worry about whether the models are um, working, are well developed, uh, um, and they can just easily access all of them to actually apply them, which is, I guess, the I hope the end goal of all um, software developers and, and academic researchers that their models are used. Um, so thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing maybe so I can see your faces. Any questions? Uh, I'm Jean Boudaram from Paris Observatory. Uh, you talk about uh, registry. It looks like it's more like a repository. Uh, the registry part you, part you mentioned it is uh, mainly about uh, fair metadata, but suppose you have some standard to describe uh, models, data, and so on. How do you manage this kind of standard? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thanks for this question. So, I am trying not to use the word repository because that's associated with GitHub most of the times, and it's a bit different from what we are trying to do. Um, so how we organize at this moment is just JSON files with a set of um, predetermined fields that we fill in for each model that we manually curate and incorporate into our hub. Um, our goal is a bit different from, for example, the initiatives that have been presented before where uh, we are not intending for researchers to comply with our um, registry um, requirements, but we actually try to actively curate and search for all this information and include it in our JSON files. Um, but this is still like work in progress. So we don't have a protocol that we have yet released, but we will for sure do. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Hi, I'm Moran Greenpeter from Software Heritage. Um, so the reg in the registry, you are linking to uh, GitHub or other collaborative platforms, or are you holding the source code in your on your platform? That's the first question. Yeah, yeah um, we are fully GitHub based, so all the backend code goes in GitHub. Excellent. The second question, uh, what persistent identifiers are you using um, on your platform? So at this moment, we give a new identifier like 
or cilia internal identifier um, to each model that we manually incorporate. And we are thinking of how to actually report that and make it more accessible, but because each model comes from different authors. Um, so we, once it's curated, it goes into our database with that identifier, which is the only way to refer to this model throughout all our system. So. Thank you. So can I propose a solution here with the software heritage identifiers? Uh, so I don't know if you know the software heritage archive, but we archive all software source code, including whatever is in Git. Um, and provide a, um, an identifier that can have different level of granularity. So just uh, to let you know that this solution can be helpful. Any persistent identifier? Yes. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so Thank you. much. Uh, just a, uh, there, well, there's one more question, but um, there was a question that sat, which I think is relevant. Um, there was a question about, is there a registry for, or a repository like firstsharing.org for machine learning terminology? Uh, I'll put this for discussion afterward, but one question that popped up was about software as a repository, given that they already have machine learning models. This is from the charts I'm reading from there. So I don't think, I don't know if this is a relevant part of this discussion, but I thought it might, might raise it from the chat as it is. Um, Daniel. Yeah, I, I think just, sorry, just as the microphone's going around, I'll just say that maybe <laughs> if we're thinking about a white paper, this is one of the questions we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about right, uh, permanent <coughs> identifiers for models that don't depend on what repository they're in, um, as well as maybe repository interoperability. Um, how do you search across all these different platforms that have different APIs? So, so we should also be thinking about kind of white paper topics as we're talking about these questions. <laughs> Um, so my question uh, goes in a little bit different uh, direction. Um, you have mentioned about uh, reproducibility and being able to re reuse mo a model that someone else uh, uploaded to your platform. But um, in this context where everything evolves so quickly, uh, this requires some maintenance, right? So who is expected to do the maintenance of the models? Is it the researcher or mm -hmm. are you and your platform also ensuring that this will be available, for instance, in newer versions of Python and so on. Yeah, Thank you. that's a great question. Uh, a nightmare, as you <laughs> point out. Um, we have a limited capacity. We are a very small organization. Um, so we resort to basically creating images of the models. So once we are able to sort all the dependencies and we know this version of the model works, um, we basically um, create an image and that's how we share it, uh, what, how we plan to share it. We are still developing the pipeline. And this does not mean that the model gets automatically updated. If the authors of the original model were to update it, which seldom happens in most of the models because they are like academic projects that get published and sit there for without further updates. So we don't have a plan yet to like automatically in, in update the images. We need to do that manually. Yeah, uh, so if there are pipelines to actually streamline that, that I'd love to chat more. But that's how we do it, yeah. All right, awesome. So um, I'd like to thank again all the, um, all the speakers up to this point. And I think we can go to the um, second part of the discussion today. Um, I know which is now. Uh, right. Yes, I'll do that slightly. So it's very better. Right. So um, the second part of, of the session today um, is something that we already kind of started one way or another, which is about thinking out how to move forward with the um, with the interest group itself. Let me see. There we go. Sorry. Um, we have four main questions at this point. The one is purely organizational, um, as Dan mentioned earlier. Uh, we are currently tentatively, the three of us, me, Dan and Leila, who are kind of running the interest group, but it would be awesome to have more people being actively involved in leading this. Um, the experience from Fair Forest Software was quite positive. So um, if anyone here or from the people remote um, is interested in sort of helping us out and taking a more leading role in this effort. Um, please feel free to step forward and either indicate it on the Google document with certain minutes or it's out to us right after and we'll try to figure it out. 
Um, we'll try to send this also as an email to the for pharmacy learning interest group altogether. And um, so everyone's aware of this is what we're trying to do. Uh, but I'll take the opportunity to sort of highlight this as a as a good opportunity. Um, the second part is about how we want to engage. So there are already a few interest group and working groups around RDA that are relevant um, to what we are attempting to do. Uh, there was a very interesting discussion early this morning, um, a meetup around ethics, AI, and how all those things are connected. And a few of the things that were raised there about um, that were essentially boiling down to either technology infrastructure um, or um, standards for machine learning. And both of them are going to be discussed in the Fair for Machine Learning focus group. So um, the other point here is about um, how to identify which are the relevant interest groups and working groups and the entities within RDA and make sure that we can effectively connect with them. Um, again, if there are any suggestions or if you're already active in one of those and you see a existing connection, it would be great to actually have this more coherently established. Um, the third point is about the actual organization of the interest group. So as an interest group, we I don't think there is any kind of a specific requirement on how often in what form to engage. So this is basically up to the interest group to decide, aside from the sessions, I think, every plenary. Um, just following up on the example of previous efforts, I would argue that having at least one monthly regular call would be a good starting point. Um, so I would like to start by proposing that. Of course, this needs to be led by the co-chairs, which also indicates one of the expectations there. Um, but I was wondering if there are any strong feelings or opinions or thoughts on that. I definitely wouldn't want to leave this like every six months because then it will be extremely slow. Um, and having it shorter than a month, I think it could be rather unfeasible. So any thoughts? or counter arguments. The downside, as you can imagine, is that RDA being a global organization severely limits the number of slots are convenient for all time zones, um, especially if you don't want to have like two um, uh, discussions on the same day to accommodate all of them. Uh, so it means that no likelihood will be either extremely early morning or extremely late night. Um, depending on your particular time zone. So keep that in mind as well. Just to, I guess, just to add to that, um, it, the one thing we didn't actually say explicitly here is, is please actually join the interest group. Oh, right. Um, right? Because, <laughs> that's just... because that's that's where we'll get the mailing list that we'll actually use. I'm sorry? How do you join it? Uh, so on the, and on the RDA homepage, you should, there's a list of interest groups. You should find this one. And then there should just be a join button and you won't see it if, or I can't remember if you won't see it or you, you won't work if you haven't signed into RDA first. So, yeah. Yeah. What's the name of the interest group? It's fair, fair for machine learning, okay. uh, fair for ML. That very, very useful information we have started with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hmm. I should just give you your own microphone. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how we work together, the Open Modeling Foundation, and because we also, we have, you know, sort of ML students that would be, you know, hired to help support, you know, our efforts. And the, I see, you know, the alignment, of course, like, and so how could we meet together, you know, like, and you were split up into different working groups right now, so standards and, you uh, and sort of discovery aspect and then best practices. There's actually an early career research group that's running the best practices group, you know, it's really uh, driven, but, and so like, you know, aligning with that too would be great. Like with our, you know, I would, wouldn't want to see like, um, you know, duplication of efforts. So um, however way we can, you know, align those efforts to uh, that would be great. But, yeah, that's why I, I was actually going to say that as well, that maybe maybe having somebody that's in that group um, that would be interested being one of the co-chairs would be a good way of doing that. And then maybe every, I don't know, maybe every third meeting or something like that we do jointly or every, I, I don't know. Yeah, at least Sandra and, <laughs> and I are the ones from that group over here at the moment. So, yeah. 
actually that would be great and um, there were two more questions one here and there Thanks. This has just been a, a fabulous uh, set of presentations and really good work on Dome and, and the other activities. I do want to make a plug. I think it's been said before, but I just want to make sure that, that it does come up, that in the fair for ML, that we do add in the components of the ethical and bias. Um, unlike many of the other fair for for, for X, this is the one area that it's really important to have it a little bit more front and centered and a little less buried in the reproducibility or, or interoperability components. So if you could raise it up a little, I, I think it would be more impactful here. Thank you for that. Um, my quick reaction is essentially, as you can see on the four bullet points, as an interest group, we are more um, flexible in what to pursue. And I would argue that if there is sufficient interest in any one topic, and in my mind, ethics in AI and how this is connected to FAIR is definitely one of those, um, we can definitely push it as a, as a task force. Um, this task force approach is something that we've seen working quite well in other interest group. Uh, essentially, there are two main options. I know that's sort of more the RDA organizational aspect. So there's one option of creating individual working groups under the interest group, so spinning them off and sort of letting them do their own thing with all the constraints that RDA puts in that. Or you can have the more, again, flexible task forces to pursue a particular outcome, hopefully being one of the, um, I know what the terminology is like, the recommended output, additional outputs. There's some kind of time <coughs> RDA there that's associated with those. So absolutely, I'm 100% I'm in favor of that. Okay, uh, I have at least two unsuccessful attempts to organize interest group at RDA because of uh, low commitment between uh, RDA meetings, like six months, as you mentioned. So uh, what I see, one of solution, we have a number of projects that already committed to uh, have interest of this, in this topic. So make between RDA at least once in two months, one of project or one of big contributors organize online workshop or seminar. This half agenda, the topic and half agenda, the interest group. And this will make uh, somebody who is already drive this and also uh, just piggyback driving the interest group activity. Because if you say who will organize, for what, for which purpose, it ended up by uh, busy, return back, we forgot. So I see one of the solution, at least from a spectrum of virtual that, that I'm involved in University of Amsterdam and Europe, we may also organize one of workshop on reproducibility. And this, then the agenda and <coughs> work items will be agreed for the interest group, uh, many, or you can push or pull who can contribute to which topic in which period. And this will be uh, quite possible, usable approach. That sounds like a good plan. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I fully agree that having a concrete outcome in mind is usually a very good driver point for anyone to contribute. Otherwise, having an open question of what are your thoughts about activities Pretty much everyone has excellent ideas, but not sufficient drive to actually pursue them. And um, so this idea of having a connection to existing projects and have joined webinars on that is actually a very good plan. So feel free to indicate or be part of the discussion or the RDA uh, mailing list, because again, we will be asking for those suggestions of projects and webinars for that. And if you're interested in being co chair, you know, there's this option as well. The um, with the with the fair for research software group, the having actually task forces that were active, having them actually report every month on what they were doing was actually also another good thing that would get people to together to to learn what the other groups had done that would then influence their task force. So I think that's maybe another element. But I, I yeah, what you said, I think sounds good, too. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm new to RDA. So please forgive me for not getting all of the terms 
exactly completely correct, but um, what I got out of this is there's a, a large number of repositories, uh, whether it is for the actual data or actually for the machine learning codes, um, and um, they're well annotated. The idea is that you know people build these for the community, so. Uh, reuse and and like kind of you know um, uh, lower the barrier to like innovation and such right so um, I'm wondering aloud what are the ethics of using that data so for example does anybody like what if what if like a company came or even a private researcher came and used that data and then decided that oh they have um they have an invention and then they're gonna go and they're gonna monetize that invention does that are the proceeds from those inventions that are being sold, is that going to be shared back with the community? How is that being dealt with? I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of um, modeling this based on the, the, the discussions that's going on with the artists and also the chat GPT that are, that are you know, monetizing other people's work. Yeah, so, so I think um, actually rather than answering the question, because I don't think we'll come up with immediately I think that that's maybe one of the topics that we should think about as a as a as a task force or as a uh, as a white paper topic is just something about I, I don't know I mean we'd have to figure out what it, how we would describe it but it could be um, something about intellectual property something about interactions with industry um, uh, so I, I think that's a, it's a good question I think that hasn't come up previously but I don't think it's uh, I don't think we're going to answer it here so one quick suggestion for, for everybody. Um, if you have access to the online document for collaborative notes, please next to your name, just indicate whether you would want to present uh, a project related to machine learning, to ethics, to repositories, if you want to propose a topic. So that would help us as well to know what is the interest of the people that it is joining the group. Right, and, and and just I think like this example, it doesn't have to be a topic where there's work that you've done that you want to present. It can be a topic where there are open questions that you feel like would be good to discuss. There's another question, I think. Well, it's not much a question, what kind of a comment, because I have experience of running an interest group and a working group, and I think that all these monthly calls, they never really work well if there is no clear goal of what you want to achieve. And I think it's only a way to keep people uh, engaged in between the plenaries. And that's when you talk about the short-term activities, I think we should set a goal. What do we want to discuss in six months from now at the next plenary? And all these calls, maybe three, four calls, not much, not more, should be basically ded dedicated to that. And here comes the idea of you know paper-driven development, charter-driven development, call it the way you want. We should focus around one topic. I don't know. For example, we can have a question. Do we need to customize fair principles for machine learning or not? And then you start writing a one pager, which is a position on what the group thinks. And then people start to have opinions because they can criticize something. They disagree with what you say. And this is how you run the group. As long as we are open and say, yeah, let's collect the topics and then make it only a showcase for project A, B, C, or D, we won't get far, we won't get this fire in people to 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 do stuff, yeah? So I would rather say, let's try to nail down today one topic that we want to work on for the next three, four months, and then we get back and discuss. And maybe a working group is not a bad idea because then you have to write a charter, which makes you focus on something. Thanks for that. So um, <laughs> I, I, I absolutely disagree. I mean, it makes sense. And we do have a concrete idea for essentially the next uh, four or five months, which is something that we are quite keen on, and it's moving slowly in one direction. Um, that being said, having a list of ideas that people are considering is interesting. And I've also put these quick three points like um, IPR, uh, ethics, and reproducibility as, as potential ideas in the Google Notes. So please have a quick look. Um, it's always good to refer back to because when we are done with one activity, we can also have one in parallel, or we can have um, like a quick review in the next plenary that we are up at this point in white paper. We can have a look in what other activities we can spin off for that or what additional chances will pop along the way. A working group is always a good idea. Um, I've had experience in, in both spinning off task force and working groups. It always comes back to uh, how much of an enthusiasm the people are behind it have. Um, so as an interest group, we can always show that these are the two options. 
Um, and if we have the um, critical mass, then yes, we can move in either direction. Um, the main consideration, as you said, is to keep people engaged and have a clear goal. The name of the Fox group, the, sorry, of the interest group is fair for machine learning. So anything that falls under that, in my mind, fits there. But personally speaking, my main curiosity is how to actually define fair in machine learning, which is an activity that we've done in research software. It is being done in for training resources. It's done in workflows. There's a lot of different things that re, um, re interpret how the fair principles are applied in that context. So this is something that is quite of interest in my mind at least, which brings me also to the last point when we can get there. So any other thoughts on short term? Yes, please. No, because the people online won't hear. So, <laughs> I think from my perspective, because there's been fair for uh, software and fair for work, there would be really a matrix set out, like under those things, what is F, what is, so that you can see where the gaps are for ML. And I'm just curious why you're not doing fair for AI. ML is a subset of So you look at everything. I... I, well, I, I'll ask by sort of a quick poll. What do you think machine learning is? How do you define it? What are, when we're talking machine learning, which part is actually the machine learning that we want to discuss? Is it the model? Is it the process? Is it the outcome? What is machine learning? So I will start by, so if we try to talk about fair for AI, like it's too big. It's like, I have no idea where to start. Even if machine learning, I think we're going to have some very interesting discussions about which part of machine learning actually focus on? Mm -hmm. Now there is a question there. Oh, he was first. I think oh, <laughs> so uh, I was also thinking, for me at least, the minute I think about machine learning, it's more about the algorithm. I've just heard a lot of discussion about the model, and um, I don't know if people think about you know, just the algorithm. And it's not necessarily research software either, right? Because you can have really very um, concise, very brief um, algorithms that are not necessarily hardened into a software. So I, I just wonder what the thoughts are. As I said, this is a very interesting discussion that we have about when we want to apply FAIR, which part of machine learning is actually the one that we want to discuss fair about. Um, there are a lot of communities that primarily focus on the model itself. There's also a consideration about fair hardware and how this is also connected to machine learning process because this is also a key component. So it's, as Dan said in the beginning, it's not just data, it's not just software, it's not just hardware, it's, it's not even just a workflow. It's all of those things at the same time. So even quantifying and identifying which one thing we're aiming for, for machine learning is going to be an achievement in my mind. Um, please. Yeah, one, one activity, and this is what we're thinking about in, um, in Open Modeling Foundation is to start with the platforms that are making this more discoverable. Talk, you know, ha have sort of a group of them come together with some of the key stakeholders. So, like the super users for, you know, for ML and uh, and really sort of boil down what are the specs, you know, what are the sort of initial requirements uh, for for them, but also get, that can feed into um, best practices and and those kind of things. So that's that's like what we're trying to develop right now, like a workshop on that, and um, it would be again great to align with this group. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, I would say that that's actually kind of what I was thinking of before when I was talking about interoperability for the repositories um, is exactly that. And that's something that came up in one of our, I don't know, one of the first, uh, I think the the plenary that we had, uh, the, the meeting we had at, at VP17, I think that was one of the things that came up is that we do have, just as the last uh, lightning talk was saying, that we have all these different systems and they all have different ideas about what metadata is and, and where it's stored and and if we could get to some idea of how to how to make all those work together, whether it's whether it's a standard or federation or something else, that would be a I think a useful thing. So that again, I, I think that from what Fotis was saying before, then what everybody else is saying, we have a bunch of different topics. Whether we kind of try to address them in parallel and task forces, whether we pick one and, and start with that, I think those are some of the questions we're trying to figure out. 
Thanks. So maybe you can reach a consensus, uh, Daniel, <laughs> and collect uh, everyone's expectation in the in the in the collaborative notes, maybe. So, given that we have five minutes before a cough break, I think. Um, so I wouldn't want to cut into that sacred part of the of the process. <laughs> um, I would propose like these two like clear. Um, steps as, as we are right now. So one is um, everyone should have access to notes. I've pasted again on the chat window of WOVA. I've pasted on the chat window of, of, of the Zoom. So please indicate ideas, short activities that you would be interested in being actively involved. I would not say leading because I know what this implies, uh, but let's put it in the way that if this is started as a task force, you would be keen on being part of the discussion there, which means essentially a commitment of attending one Zoom per month or something like that. The second activity would be on our site is to send an email to the Fair for Machine Learning Interest Group mailing list. First of all, asking for participants. Second, sending also this link to the Google document with the list of the activities that will clean up a bit so it makes it a bit more presentable. Um, and also propose that we have this monthly regular call of the entire interest group. So at least in our first call after the plenary, we'll have, we'll kill, kickstart at least one task force. And one task force at the very least will be actually, oops, sorry, wrong direction, <laughs> um, will be this one. Uh, because if anything else, I'll be quite keen in, in pursuing that more effectively, which will boil down again to the question of which part of machine learning we'll need to discuss the fair about. Uh, but this is a whole different discussion to be had and not in like five minutes. So um, please go ahead. Yeah, so so just to, uh, I think just to repeat the, the thing that maybe is the primary piece then is to actually join the, join the group. Um, and if you have any problems finding the notes or anything else, send, send a note to one of the three of us, which you can find from the group page. Um, and then we'll 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 see what everybody wants to do. Again, I, I think the the fair for uh, research software group um, was successful because we came up with uh, because we came up with task forces and we were able to work on those task forces and we were able to do that because we had people that were willing to to lead those task forces. Um, and so uh, again, I, I think that would be maybe the last piece is if there is something that you're interested in. Um, Somebody will have to lead it, and if nobody leads it, it probably won't happen. So, if you're interested enough to lead it, it will happen. So, oops, oh, got it. <clears throat> right. Two minutes to the break. Any last thoughts or comments or suggestions? We've captured quite a lot of stuff on the Google document, at least in terms of ideas, rather structured. So, please feel free to put stuff in. Oh, let me look at the chat as well. Sorry. Okay, and, and just as we're doing this, I'm going to say, um, at least for me and maybe Layla as well, uh, thank you to FOTUS very much for actually taking the lead and making this happen. So. It's always a useful effort. So thank you. All right, coffee time. Yeah, I'm sorry.